Oh, thank you very much. Um, the title's a bit misleading. Um, it's not really the first 100 years. It's the first 68 years, because I think computing started in 1948. If by computing we mean a programmable device where you can change the program in memory. So the first 68 years is what I'll be talking about. But it's 100 years, so I'm going to be guessing what's going to happen in the next 32 years. So part of this is speculation as what's going to happen in the next 32 years, and part of it's history. Um, what happened in the, in the last few years. So um, I also start with my obligatory Alan Kay quote, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And uh, so I'm going to be inventing a little bit of future to see if we can do that. And why am I doing that? Um, I, I give quite a few talks and um, I meet a lot of programmers and programming tends to be a fairly young skill. So, First, I'd ask, you know, how, how many of you are 45 and under? Right. So I've been programming for more than 45 years. <laughs> so I've been programming for more years than your entire life. And, and what I've noticed is I kind of assumed that if you were 30, 40, something like that, that you actually knew what happened before you were born. And, and that's not the case. Um, the more I talk to people, the more I'm convinced that you don't actually knew what happened before you were born. You, you might have read about it in books. So some of you haven't even read about it in books. Um, for me, it's not a question of reading about it in books, because I, I was there and did it. So, so I thought I'd tell you some of these things that have happened. So I have two themes in this kind of lecture, um, which I'm developing. One, one is to try and tell you about the stuff that we collectively have forgotten. I, when I say we, I don't, you know, I mean the, the entire programming community. A lot of stuff we've forgotten, or perhaps we never knew. And uh, I want to tell you about some of those things, and I, I will be developing uh, those themes in, in lectures and talks that I'm giving. And the, the second thing is um, the new technologies that we are inventi inventing are not without danger. Um, I, I think that computing is rather like kids running into a sweetie shop and just sort of, oh, we can build this, and we, we build all this stuff. And, and we don't really know what the consequences of building this stuff are. So I'm kind of worried that some of the stuff we're building will, will be very dangerous. And so I, I want to talk about some of those dangers. And, and that's also an indication of where we should be working in the future, it's to solve those, those dangers and do something about it. I mean, me and my colleagues have made a complete mess of everything. And, and then at the moment I'm retired, so you know, having fucked up absolutely everything, we go, right, off we go, and you guys can fix it up. Um, I also thought at a conference like this, it, it should be a bit of fun. Um, and I think uh, it's very good that people meet each other. So I'm going to do an experiment, which um, the, the idea occurred to me um, in, in my last week, actually. And I thought, oh, how, how could I illustrate parallel programming and how could we do things? So, so I got myself this which is, this, this is going to be very noisy, because um, you're all going to be talking at once, so I've, can, can, you, can you hear that? Anybody not hear that? Right, so the, the goal of this is to get to know each other, because uh, some of you know each other and you're sitting next to each other, but others are total strangers, so you don't know each other. So I'm going to do a parallel algorithm and some sequential algorithms, just because I like parallel programming. So the first algorithm is that We'll start here, and you introduce yourself to this guy, and when you've done that, you introduce yourself to this guy. Now, I'd assumed you're all sitting next to each other, so you'll have to kind of shout over to this guy, and, and a wave front will propagate like this, and it will go to here, and it will go backwards and forwards. And if I hit this a couple of times, you stop, okay? That's the first rule, so off you go. Now, now, now this, this isn't going to work, is it? No. no. So this is the first algorithm. Look, you, um, we, we all have to introduce each other. Um, I, I'd assumed a, a kind of um, regular... Oh, it went. I kind of assumed a regular pattern with odd and even people. Now, if, if you were talking 
Well, you two are talking. If you're talking to him, you can't be listening in that direction. So you can only talk in one direction and listen. You can't be both talking and listening at the same time. If I turn to the left and speak in that direction, I'm not going to hear something that um, comes from the opposite direction. And some of you have never met before, and, and there are some very attractive people in the audience. And if you, know, you should fall in love with the person who you're sitting next to because of this introduction and have five kids, and, and if they become circus artists, I expect you to send me a free ticket to the circus so that, um, so that something good will have come out of this. So here was the first algorithm. And just for a regular um, matrix of n by m things, you, you just sort of, where's my pointer? There's my pointer. You go like this, da, 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 da. And when you get to the end, you, you turn around again and do it in the opposite direction, then everybody will know each other. And that's a pretty bad algorithm. So we'll make a much better algorithm. Now, fortunately, you know which seat numbers you're on. If you don't, you'll have to stand up and look at the seat under. You're either on an odd-numbered seat or an even-numbered seat. OK, so find out your seat number. This is when it's going to be noisy. <laughs> okay, you all, you all know your seat numbers, right. So, so the out, now you're clear, you know if you're an odd or even, yeah? Everybody knows, good. So in, the, in pass one, odds talk to the right, evens listen to the left. And in pass two, evens talk to the left, odds listen to the right. In pass three, ev evens talk to the right, odds listen to the left. And in can you read that? And, and I'll give a little ding to, to change the passes. So on the first ding, uh, odds talk to the right and evens listen to the left. Ah, good. So, how long did this algorithm take? What was that? Oh, the battery thing. Um, OK, so the sequential algorithm took roughly two n times m um, messages. And the parallel algorithm took four messages. OK, so if, if we were 50 by 20, a matrix, um, the speed up would be a factor of 500. OK, so parallel algorithms are much nicer than sequential algorithms. And does everybody know everybody now? Well, say yes, please. OK, so parallel programmers do it in Erlang or Alexia. That was the, the message. And you should all learn parallel programming, because the world is parallel. We're, we're building lots of multi-cores, and, and uh, a lot of problems are parallel problems. Right, so that was, that was the little interlude, and goodness knows how long the rest of the lecture is going to take. So history. Um, so for me, I, I think history starts in 1948. And this guy, Tom Kilburn, uh, is the world's first programmer. Um, and he's standing there with something called the Williams Kilburn tube. That was a cathode ray tube that could store or could display, I think it was 2048 bits, or was it 1024 bits? The first one was 1024, and then I think they, they extended it that. So actually, the program and the state of the program and all the data was in 1024 bits and was displayed on a cathode ray tube. And this could stably store memory for up to one hour. It was, it was developed in the United Kingdom. And uh, this is Kilburn's logbook. And the, the date, wait a minute, where do we press? The date is up there, you see, 19, it's the 19th of June. Uh, is that June, January, February, March, April, May? Yeah, 19th of June, 1948. And that's the first program, which is there. And actually um, worked out the factors of a composite number. So they put a prime number in and said that the highest factor was 1, which, which meant that it was a prime number. And it ran on the 19th of June, 1948. And uh, there's the program uh, a little bit more clearly written out. 
And that ran on this machine. And uh, Freddie Williams wrote, a program was laboriously inserted and the start switch pressed. Immediately, the spots on the display tube entered a mad dance. In early trials, it was a dance of death leading to no useful result. And that was even worse, without yielding any clue as to what was wrong. But one day, it stopped. And there, shining brightly at the expected place, was the expected answer. It was a moment to remember. This was in June 1948. And nothing was ever the same again. And he didn't actually realize how true that was, because this was the start of the computing age. This is the start of this 100-year period I'm talking about. And we are now 2 thirds of the way through that period. So computing is an incredibly young science. I mean, it's, you know, you compare it to things like the Hundred Years' War. I mean, this is a, an incredibly short period of time. And it's progressed very rapidly in the last 10 to 15 years. And here is the, the Williams Tube at the Manchester Museum of Science. This is a replica that they built of the small-scale experimental machine. And uh, here I am. Um, on my holiday, I go and look at old computers and take my wife around all these museums. and she, she loves looking at old computers, I think. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> well, she says she likes it. And, and I actually got to put a program into this thing. And, and uh, you, you, you enter the program here by, by sticking numbers in, and then you hit enter. On, on, on. It's a lovely machine. Um, oh, and there's a number there. OK, 0.0000475. And, and this is my normalization factor. I am taking one as a Cray-1, because the Cray-1 was the first supercomputer, and I loved the Cray-1. Uh, so, so I'm going to show you a few computers. And, and, uh, let's... So the next machine, actually, it doesn't have a number, because I, I wasn't able to work out how fast it was. So I've just put a few question marks. It's probably 0 0.001 of a Cray-1, and it's a DDP-516. And uh, this was the first computer I got to play with all by myself. And, and the programs were entered with a tele... Well, actually, you see this thing up here? Those are called sense switches. The first program, when, when you booted the thing, you had to enter a number on here. This is a 16-bit thing. And you, you put the 16-bit bit pan in, and then you press load and store. And you enter the first program. Now, the first program is a program that reads a paper tape. Right. And so once you've entered the first program, which takes about half an hour because there's a lot of instructions, then you can run it. And you put a paper... Oops, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong button. You put, a, you put the paper tape into this machine here, the teletype here, and you run the first program. And then the first program is a program that can read programs from the card reader. And then you put your punch cards into the card reader, which, which I haven't shown there, and it reads them all in, and, and off you go. Now, this had... Let me see. Whoops, no, no, that's the next slide. This had 32 kilobytes of 16-bit memory. And, uh, of course, big programs couldn't fit into it. So they were written in Fortran, and they were written using things called overlays. You had to split your program up into bits that would fit into 16 kilobytes. You load the first bit in, and that loads the next bit in, and then the first bit and the second bit, and it, it, it's rather slow. And when we had these things, my, uh, we, we got, after a few years, we got something called the Glass TTY. Which is the Glass TTY, it's a terminal. And you could actually enter your programs, not on punched cards, but you could sit at this glass TTY, at a screen with a little keyboard, enter them, and store them on disk. Ah, this was fantastic. This really improved turnaround. And I said to my boss, you know, one day, everybody will have glass TTYs to enter their data in, and everybody will store their programs on disk. And he said, Joe, you're mad. You're completely, you're a lunatic. That will never happen. I said, why? Well, you know, the, the disk costs, you know, 20,000 euros or something like that, and the glass TTY costs 10,000 euros. They're far too expensive. Nobody will, nobody will ever do this in the future. Guess who was right? <laughs> Joe won, boss is zero. OK. So, in 1975, the Cray-1 came out. Now, this was the first supercomputer. Um, it was... It looked like that. It, had a, it even came with a, with a sort of tailored leather seat around the outside you could sit on. 
and, and it's circular so that the, to, to minimize the cable length between the separate units. So, so these are the CPU and the memory units. And uh, just a little bit of its vital statistics. It was the world's first supercomputer, which is why it's pretty exciting. It had an, what? Don't do that. It had an 80 megahertz clock. 80 megahertz, isn't that stupendously fast? It, had, it consumed a mere 115 kilowatts of power and weighed 5.5 tons uh, and cost $10 million. And it had eight megabytes of memory. I mean, this was fantastic. I, I, um, I was a summer in, I used to be a physicist, and I was a summer intern at CERN. And, and I ended up in the program advisory office. And I, I could program the Cray-1. You know, I'd heard, I, there was one in all of Europe. All of Europe had one supercomputer. And I could program it. And I wasn't allowed to sit on the bench. You know, only the guys in the white coats could sit on the bench. You know, so, but, but I didn't have a white coat because I was in the back office. But, but I could program the Cray-1. And it was so fast that, that you, you didn't put punch cards in. There was a load of IBM 360s and, and CDC 7600s that did the I.O. And then once, once they'd read all the punch cards and things, they then talked to the Cray-1 that did the, the work instantaneously. There's a lot of good physics. This was used to discover the quark model, you know, quarks and things like that, the omega minus particle. Murray Gell-Mann was at CERN, and quarks were discovered using the Cray-1. Great stuff. Fantastic. Right. So here's me next to the Cray-1 at the National Museum of, of, of Computing at Bletchley. I sat on the um, thing before the people told me to stand up because you were not supposed to sit on it, but it doesn't, I don't know if it actually works. Great place to go. If you're ever in Great Britain, go to the National Museum of Computing. They've got the computer that Tim Berners-Lee did the World Wide Web on. It's, it's a wonderful place, full of very exciting things. There you go. So the next computer is the VAX 11, whoops, hello, come back, VAX 11780. Uh, this came out in 1975. This was kind of computing for the masses or for people in scientific labs. We got hold of VAXs. Um, the 11780 was 0. 0.00625 of a Cray-1. You see, it wasn't as powerful as a Cray-1. But I don't know if any have heard, heard of this expression. Vax MIPS. Has anybody heard of that? Vax MIPS. Okay, so the 11780 defined the term MIPS, million instructions per second. It was the first commercial computer that you could buy for a reasonable amount of money that would do a million instructions per second. So it's called a Vax MIPS. And it ran at 0.006 times the speed of the Cray-1. Okay, it was a bit expensive. Um, so in, in fact, I didn't have an 11780. We had the cheaper model, which was 11750. And that's the computer that I developed Erlang on. It was a Vax 11750. And it was done with VT52s. They, they weren't bitmap terminals. They came later. With Sun started the first bitmap terminals. You had to type your program in there. Uh, this was before the days of full screen editors. They were just line editors and everything like that. And then somebody thought, oh, we can make a full screen editor. What a good idea. So they did. Right. Now I'm just going to hop forward a little bit. This guy is 256 times a Cray-1. I gave a lecture, and I was waving my iPhone, and I said, you realize this is more powerful than a Cray-1? And I hadn't checked my figures. This little fella is 256 times a Cray-1. This is 256 times as powerful as the most powerful computer in the world in 1975. OK, so we can do Pokemon Go and all sorts of things. You know, a really useful <laughs> thing. Right, this is lovely, I, I love this. This is 15 Cray ones. It's a Raspberry Pi. I, I was in Chicago, and somebody said, can, can, can you run Erlang on a really weak little embedded computer, an ARM computer or something, you know, like a Raspberry Pi? And I, I just said, you're joking, you're joking. You know, you're talking about a supercomputer. Erlang was developed on a machine that is infinitely weaker than this. You know, this is 15 times the power of a Cray-1, 15 times the power of the most powerful computer in the world. Does it? Do I get the impression when I use it that it's faster than a Cray-1? No, I don't, actually. 
because all the software is totally fucked up. What the hardware gives us, the software takes away, and the damn thing goes slowly, <laughs> because they put megabytes and gigabytes of rubbish onto it before it even boots. This is something you have to fix. An operating system, you know, an old operating system back in 1980 was one and a half megabytes, OK? An update of Keynote on my Mac is like 100 megabytes, right? It's 80 times, 70 times the size of an entire operating system in the mid-70s. And I cannot understand why. What the hell is in this 100 megabytes? Of, even if it's full of images and things, how can it be so big? Could it be that Apple are just putting huge programs to take up all the space on your disk so you have to buy a more expensive computer? Whoa, I, I wonder. You know, it's, what are they up to? And don't get me on the cloud. I mean, why? why oh, sorry. This is blackmail by storing all your stuff on the cloud. Um, right. This is the um, NVIDIA Tesla P100, which is 66,000 times the power of a Cray 1. This is scary stuff. This is the sort of thing that you're going to use to beat the world champion at Go with machine learning algorithms. This is the thing that's going to cause mass unemployment, that's going to take away vast numbers of jobs if they get to manage to program it. The only problem is programming it. If we can program that to do machine learning, it's going to successively take over all sorts of jobs and things. So it's a really scary machine. <laughs> Fortunately, there's an even more powerful. I mean, this is 66,000 times more powerful than the Cray 1. But we've got this fella here. And that's 10 to the 8 times the power of the Cray 1. And runs at 30, 38 petaflops at 15 watts. And at the moment, we hold the world record in computing power. So, so the hardware hasn't caught up with us yet. And it's got 86 billion neurons in it. It's about 5 million years old. And it's gone through lots of generations. It's a pretty, pretty good computer, actually. So this is, this is our defense against this thing. You know what we do? We unplug it. <laughs> that, that's the way to, to win. OK, it's, it's a timeline. Could, could somebody tell me what time I have to finish? Does anybody know? Oh, dear. I'm going to have to, I think I'm supposed to finish at 10, so I have to rush through stuff. OK, so I'll uh, skip through that. Uh, storage is the same story, really. Um, here's me next to a four megabyte disk in the National Museum of Computing. Uh, the, the, I sh the photo's not very good, but as you can see, it comes up to here. So the, the notion of digital, photo I mean, digital photography, every picture's like four megabytes, and digital music. You know, four megabytes per song. Digital music and digital photography are enabled by massive memories. It's a technology shift. There's not going to be digital music when, when that thing, when you carry that fellow around. Uh, it weighed, what does it weigh? It doesn't say what it weighs. I didn't try picking it up. Well, they wouldn't let me. I wouldn't try picking it up. Probably weighs about 30 kilos, I guess. Cost $10,000, no, $100,000. And you're not going to have it in your backpack or anything. So, so storage has made a massive gain. And um, that mobile data, well, uh, I used to work for Ericsson for years. So this is the first mobile phone. Um, system A, 1956, and weighed 40 kilograms. So again, not, not very useful for, for mobile computations. Um, but you can see how it's come on. And now it's gone from that. It's all baked into an iPhone. And we now have. Just to, to summarize it, I mean, now from 1948 to 2016, computers are insanely fast. They are ridiculously fast. So why, why are people worried about efficiency? Because the machine is just so stupidly fast, you don't need to bother. And even if you, how do you, how do you, make, a, how do you make a program speed up? How do you make your program go a thousand times? Erlang is a million times faster than the first time I, I made it. Why is that? Because 20 years has passed. If you wait 10 years, your program will go 1,000 times faster. If you wait 20 years, it'll be a million times faster. I don't see that stopping. That's not going to happen. It's going to carry on like that. Uh, we've got massive amounts of memory, terabytes of memory. Uh, the, only, the only reason we don't have terabytes of memory in our phones, the only reason we have gigabytes of memory 
is the rate at which the memory manufacturers release memory into new devices, because basically they want to charge you money every year to double them. You know, they could give you a thousand times more memory tomorrow if they wanted to, but then they can't sell you double the memory every year. So that's the only reason why we don't have massive memories. And uh, we're, we're going to have massive bandwidth. We're going to go over from wireless to, to using lasers. When you put LED light bulbs in your rooms, uh, you can modulate information on that. So you can use white light lasers instead of that. So all you have to do is screw out your light bulbs, put in Li-Fi white bulbs, and you'll be easily going at 10 gigabits per second line of sight with no interference, so people can't spy on you as well. So we're going to have billions of small computing devices. This is called the Internet of Things, or some people call it the Internet of Useless Things. Um, and we don't know what to do with them. I, 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 I was listening to the radio, and, and this guy said, well, every household's going to have five, 500 devices. We're going to have pillars that tell you when they need washing. And my wife said, well, that's, that's absolutely just what I need, a pillar that talks to me and tells me when it needs washing. I mean, this is a great... And some of you are going to work on this stuff. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> yeah, it's great. There are other projects you could work on, as well as talking pillars and things, but, but never mind. Right, so what's going to happen in the next 50 years? Sorry? Oh, I have 10-10. Oh, thank you very much. Good. Okay, so what's going to happen? So just, this is a rhetorical question. Do you think this development's going to stop? I've seen the last 45 years of this. If, if you're 20 or 25, you're going to be programming for another 20 or 30 years. Do you think this development's suddenly going to stop? No, of course it's not going to stop. It's accelerating, if anything. It's very exciting, actually. You know, the first 100 years of any science, you know, from 1600 to 1700, Newton came along and did Principia Mathematica and that kind of... And then physics exploded in this first 100 years, and then it kind of slowed down. And we're in this 100-year period when it's exploding. It's all very fun. And I was very lucky to be around at the right time. So hardware is insanely fast, so we can do anything with it. Can we? Is that right? Come on. Yes, no. Votes for yes, we can do anything. No? OK, votes for no, we can't. Yeah, right. <laughs> Wrong. I mean, you can't do anything with it. Um, so, I always, because I'm a physicist, I, I get back to numbers. This is numbers 101, so um, it's good to have a few numbers in the back of your head. The Earth has about 10 to the 50 atoms on it. So 10 to the 50 is a nice number to remember. It's easy to remember. Earth's got 10 to the 50 atoms. Uh, so let's write a program. Uh, Oh, yeah, let's make, a, let's make a laptop, the ultimate laptop. Weighs one kilogram. We stuff more and more components onto it. It gets hotter and hotter, denser and denser. It becomes a black hole. So we have a black hole laptop. Uh, it can do 10 to the 51 operations per second. It's 10 to the minus 27 of a meter small. It can store 10 to the 16 bits. And it lasts for 10 to the minus. It's, it's, it explodes. And it lasts for 10 to the minus 21 of a second. And the information, the result of the computation, appears through quantum entanglement somewhere else in the universe instantaneously. So there's a problem with I.O., so we don't actually know how to get any output from this thing. Right. So that's the ultimate computer. And, whoops, the ultimate printer is... Well, let's make the ultimate printer. We'll take the entire universe. That's the biggest thing we can think of. And we, take the small, we divide it by the smallest thing we can think of. The smallest thing known to physics is the Planck length. Uh, so the smallest volume, the smallest pixel to make a 3D printer is 10 to the minus 105 meters cubed. You divide one by the other. Um, we made a printer out of the entire universe, sort of flattening it into a huge sheet of paper. And it can print 10 to the 185 pixels. So this is the biggest printer in the world. You can't currently buy this from Hewlett-Packard. They, they don't actually make them this big at the moment. Um, so it's 10 to the 185 pixels. And uh, so is this big enough for the output of our programs? The answer is no, of course. Otherwise, we wouldn't answer it. OK, so here's a little program. For i in 1 to 6 double factorial print i, that's a little, tiny little program. Wait a moment. What's that thing? A six double factorial. It's a three characters, three characters long. Six, how big is six double factorial? Well, 
Six factorial, you know what factorial is, don't you? Six factorial is 720. So six double factorial is 720 times 710 times 709. And each of those terms, you know, 720 is bigger than 10, 710 is bigger than 10, 709 is bigger than 10. And that's repeated 700 times, and there's these stuff at the end. So six double factorial is much, much greater than 10 to the power of 711. OK? So remember, I said the biggest printer in the universe can print 10 to the 185 pixels. So this little program, that little program, cannot be printed on the biggest printer that we could conceive of in the entire universe. So I was thinking of writing a paper, you know, consider the class of programs with three characters in them. This is insanely complicated. So underlying computation is a mathematics. If, if we, we can't test this program, we can't run it, we can't do it exhaustively. We have to use mathematics to understand how it works. We have to prove things about it. You could prove that that program terminates, but it would be useless because you could figure out, OK, the next computer over and above the laptop as a quantum computer is to take the entire universe as a quantum computer. So that will do, that's, if you do that from the time the universe is booted, it's done 10 to the one, 10 to the 123 operations since the universe was booted. And, and that's way smaller than this. So we couldn't actually even compute this. Um, or, well, we could prove mathematically it would terminate, but it will not terminate within the life of the universe. So we'd need multi multiverses to do that, which is kind of fun. Right, so let's go on. Um, my, my conclusion from that is that pro programs are insanely complicated. They're all black holes of complexity right in the middle of your programs. There's certain programs you just can't exhaustively test them or do anything with them. Ten plus ten. Right. Dangerous. Dangerous. Right. I, I just take a couple of these. So this is Rebecca Burkett. Um, and the photo was taken, if you look at the back of the photo, it was taken in 18, 1892. And my wife um, is interested in genealogy, and she was looking through these old photos and said, oh, look, this is Rebecca. But, and then she said, um, when we're dead and gone, uh, will, will our, um, you know, all this stuff, all the photos we publish on Facebook, that, all these photos that have vanished into the cloud, will, will our... Well, our answer, you know, in 100 years' time, in 200 years' time, will, will they be able to see these photos? And I thought, that's an that's a interesting question. So I happened to be on a panel debate with uh, some guy who was quite high up in Facebook. So, so I said, um, you know, all these photos we take on Facebook, um, are they still going to be around in 200 years' time so that people could look at them? What about all our, all our stuff we're doing? Did you know what he said? He said, that's a very good question, he said. <laughs> right, so problem number one is saving our history. I think, I'm rather worried that I wouldn't, you know, sometimes I start, I like writing and sometimes I might try to write science fiction and I'm like 200 years, 400 years ahead and say, um, unfortunately, all the history from 2000 to, to, you know, to 2220 was accidentally lost because we put it in the cloud and encrypted it all and nobody can remember how to get it out. <laughs> this is a real problem. We are putting more and more stuff into the cloud. We're encrypting it. And most of the cloud is paid storage. Okay? So you stop paying, it's not stored anymore. Or is it? Or what happens to it? Well, nobody knows. And anyway, which cloud? Apple's cloud, Google's cloud, they're all fighting in Microsoft's cloud. So I'm really worried that we're going to lose history. And uh, so how much data are we talking about? What about history? Where, where is the data store? Who's going to pay for it all? Who can access the information? How long is it going to be stored for? Goodness, how is the data named? Well, I don't know. Well, how many documents are there? Well, there's 10 to the 9 people on the planet. The, the sun will become a red giant in 5 times 10 to the 9 years. We might write, say, 1,000 documents a year that we want to store. So that's 10 to the 25 documents. And the Earth's got 10 to the 50 atoms. So maybe we could do that. I don't know 
what happens after the sun becomes a red giant? Um, maybe we can beam it off into outer space and hope somebody... You know, I've, oh, sorry, long aside, which I haven't got time for. Uh, OK, so let's store everything in a content addressable store. Um, and I've only got five minutes, so I won't go into that. Uh, content addressable stores are wonderful things. We can't talk about things unless things have got names. So this is a basic philosophical thing. If something has a name, we can talk about it. And so things that don't have names, we can't talk about. And a content addressable store is we name things with a cryptographic checksum. So for example, you can use MD5, SHA1, SHA256 to name a blob of data. OK, so this is like more general than a key value store. A key value store, you've got a key and a value. This is a value store. You just store blobs. Uh, there is a kind of key. It's implied by the data. The, the, the key is the SHA1 checksum of the data. And so a content addressable store would look like, and I want you to build this thing. OK, I will go and build one myself, but really it needs international collaboration, it needs standards collaboration. So I would like to go to any website anywhere on the planet and say, get SHA1, and there's an SHA1 checksum, and it'll either say, yeah, here you are, woof, and you get some data back, or say, sorry, haven't got it. OK, this is immune to a man in the middle attack, so it doesn't need any security, because once you've got that data, you can compute it, in this case, an SHA1 checksum, and see if it's the same as the data was. So you could layer security on top of this. This is the underlying mechanism. And you could publish it on any site. In fact, you need to make it slightly more complicated than this. The, res the response to a GET request would be the data itself. Or it would say, sorry, I haven't got this, but here are some other machines that you might like to look at, because I think they might have it. And these, there's a peer-to-peer -peer system called Catamelia, which is used in the views system. It's used by the file sharing networks. This works fine. You know, people share movies on it, millions of movies, millions of views, millions of. You know, this is a big DHT. We could put all of human information into a massive planetary wide DHT and thereby save history, which would be kind of fun. So the API is like this. It's even easier than a key value store. It's just put data, bang, yep. Uh, don't know. Did it work? Don't know. You have to read it back to see if you can find it again. That's pretty easy. It's a value only. If you thought key value stores are useful, value only stores are even more fun. And there's a few references you can look up. IPSF, one Bennett, where is he? Wave, shout. Yeah, great. He's giving a talk about IPFS. And he's actually building one of these things. So this is great stuff. This is fantastic stuff. Because one, it's going to save us, it's going to save our history. So, you know, thousands of years' time, they're going to say, thanks to Juan Bennett and the people who helped him from Barcelona, we've saved history. Right. And there's some other stuff. Um, uh, Vince Cerf is very keen on this. He, he's coined this term digital vellum, the organized conferences on, on... He's more worried about the hardware and, and the formats that... I mean, OK, so we've got the data for early computers, but hang on, we haven't got the early computers. Can we emulate the early computers? so we can rerun these programs and things like that. And Tim Berners-Lee has just done some stuff called Solid. And there's things like Git Torrent, which is, the trouble with Git, you know, once you've got checksum, you, you need to know the site where it's on. It's on GitHub or it's somewhere else. You don't know that. It, it should be in a huge, massive DHT. And I've got four minutes left, so. Problem two, creating a computational infrastructure. Uh, we're using about 3%, between 3 and 6 it depends how you calculate. We're using about 3% of the world's energy to run data centers so we can share pictures with each other. And we do have climate problems. Uh, so we need to do something about that. So we need to build a personalized computational infrastructure. And I'm not any good at hardware, so I, I thought if, if, you can't, if you can't build something yourself, build a prototype, describe it to people, some hardware people will build it, and then I can use it, and I can go and buy it. So, so this is what I want. Uh, this is what Alan Kay did. Um, he, he went around with a cardboard thing like this. This was a Dynabook prototype. And um, Steve Jobs sort of latched onto this, and they made the iPad, which wasn't actually, you know, Alan Kay's really pissed off about the iPad because it's not, it's not the Dynabook. And, and basically, Apple, Apple have made this device, but they haven't let, they haven't let kids program it. It's difficult to program. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a ubiquitous open platform that anybody can program. It's a, 
It's a closed platform, which only Apple will let you program. Uh, and that inspired the iPad. So I thought, well, I, I'd make a model of a, a ubiquitous computer that I want somebody to build. And here it is in operation on, on my roof. <laughs> and it worked fine in Spain. It's a nice sunny place. So it's a solar panel. Well, I thought, solar panels are made of silicon. Processors are made of silicon. Memories are made of silicon. Antennas are made of silicon. Flash memory is made of silicon. li fi is made of silicon. So why not just blow them all onto a solar panel? Get 135 watts per square meter if you're lucky, maybe 50 watts per square meter. Processor runs at about you know, two or three watts. Uh, that could talk to your local computer uh, with Wi-Fi. And you keep all your personal data on this. It's absolutely crazy. Every time we book an airline ticket or a hotel, we leak massive amounts of information to commercial interests. Uh, and it's for their benefit, it's not for our benefit. What we should do is, suppose you want to book an airline at the moment, an airline ticket in a hotel and a hire car because you're going on holiday. What you do is you go to some booking site, you go to airline number one, and you say, how much does it cost to go to Barcelona for the weekend? And you get a quote or something like that. Ah, oh, it's too expensive, I'll try booking site number two. You get a different quote, but they already know you've been to, to site number one, and you know, they, they sniff your computer. Oh, he's got a fancy new MacBook. Or, you know, um, he can afford a lot. Oh no, he's got a crap old Windows machine. It would be cheaper, you know. So they're not doing it for our benefit. And then you go and you want a hotel and things like that. So the alternative, you keep this data on your own computer at home. You don't leak anything to anybody. You, you go to 10 travel agents and say, can I have your computer program, please? I want to run it locally. You, you, you request these programs, you run them locally, and that each of them gives you a quote. And the hotels give you a quote. You haven't revealed to anybody what dates you're moving. You haven't revealed your plans. You haven't told the NSA. You haven't told the national security. There's no privacy issues. You run it locally on your machine. And then you send out the answers to the ones, you know, I'm choosing you, you, and you. And you haven't incidentally leaked all this information about yourself to advertising agencies and to security agencies and everybody else. We need to bring back computing to the people. OK. So once it's like that, it will talk to the neighbors' houses. It will talk to your house. Um, a little battery when the sun goes down. Uh, it might not work. <laughs> I don't know. And, and then, of course, you can stick it on your car roof. And then when you drive it into a, a parking lot of a big supermarket, you know, there'll be thousands of 500 cars. And it will form a supercomputing cluster. It will just say, hello. Oh, there's another computer there. And it will just build a supercomputer. Uh, and it's just entire. And as the sun goes around the Earth, the computations will follow it, the data will follow it, and it will it'll be a green computer. We can throw away all these data centers. Right. So, yeah, that's what you could do is it. stick with it. Um, yeah, whatever. Stick it on your roof and your house becomes a supercomputer. Keep your own data on your own computer. Make a planetary-wide global store with renewable resources for the benefit of everybody. So that's what you guys have got to do. I've, I'm kind of not so active program. Well, yeah, I am actually, but I'm sort of, it's like a drug, you know. I'm in sort of withdrawal at the moment because I don't do it as much as I used to. So, finally, just, you know, have fun and have a great conference. And thank you very much. <laughs>